Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Illinois Chamber of Commerce 2020 annual meeting. My name is Brent Eichelberger, CEO of Commerce Bank in Illinois. And I'm honored to be the Illinois Chamber of Commerce board chair. In the spirit of agility this year, we pivoted to a virtual meeting and we have a great program lined up for you today. With this event would not be possible without all the great sponsors and I would like to briefly recognize and thank our major sponsors of today's event. These sponsors are State Farm, Federal Company, Illinois Soybean Association, UPS, Inland Real Estate Group, Commerce Bank, Caterpillar, Wind Trust, Illinois Health and Hospital Association, Allstate, Union Pacific, First Mid Bank and Trust, The Boeing Company, Northwestern Medicine, and FGMK. So let's get the program moving, and I'd like to introduce Todd Meisch, President and CEO of the Illinois Chamber. Todd? Let me add my thanks to all of our sponsors and all of you for participating in this event. Uh, I think we're all kind of getting used to this, but at the same time, really looking forward to hopefully a 2021 where we can all be in the same room together and interact in ways you can't just do virtually. Uh, but for now, uh, thanks to all of our leadership that has made this event possible for dealing with a unique uh, set of uh, circumstances and very much appreciate uh, everybody's work work to make this happen and be the success that it has. So let me go ahead and just tell you that uh, we'll be moving on uh, to a panel discussion with Tim Crane, uh, president of Wintrust, uh, together with Tom Ricketts, who you, I think you see on the screen there, uh, executive chairman of the Chicago Cubs, and uh, Charles Evans, uh, the president of the Chicago Fed. All three of these individuals and their organizations are financial experts, and they also have made huge commitments, very important commitments, to another very, very important uh, both business issue and societal issue, which is economic opportunity in distressed communities in particular. They all participate in all of our uh, economic uh, regions, but uh, I think we all know that a special effort in areas of distressed communities is needed. All three of these entities uh, have made uh, substantial uh, commitments there, and we're very excited to hear about those and how the business community can move forward to move an important uh, agenda item uh, going forward. So those are the two things we want to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about recovery of, from the uh, COVID uh, uh, recession, which is devastating lots of small businesses. We hope they all come back. We hope that Congress uh, acts uh, responsibly to go ahead and bring back as many businesses as possible. But then we're also going to talk about economic opportunity. Uh, so for now, uh, we're very, uh, uh, very pleased to go ahead and introduce Charles Evans, who's the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. He's been the president since 2007. He serves on the FOMC, the Federal Open Committee, uh, which determines policy making for the Fed. Uh, beforehand, he served as uh, both the director of research and the senior vice president of uh, the Chicago Fed. So Charles, uh, we're very, very happy you're joining us here today. We appreciate the Fed's commitment to certainly helping the overall uh, American economy, but especially a renewed commitment to distressed um, uh, communities uh, that need the extra help. So Charles, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Todd and uh, Brent, uh, for putting together such a wonderful gathering. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with the members of the Illinois Chamber of Commerce. And let me just remind everybody that these are my own views and not those of anyone else on the Federal Open Market Committee or, or in the Federal Reserve System. Uh, I was very glad to see that the Illinois Chamber was focusing its annual meeting on economic development in distressed communities. And I was also heartened to hear that Timothy Crane would be announcing that a new bank branch would soon be opening in Chicago's Lawndale neighborhood. A thin silver lining of our current virtual environment is that it allows those from outside the city and across the state to join us without a long journey. 
So I also want to acknowledge those from near and far as we celebrate the important addition of financial services to one of Chicago's distressed communities. While every neighborhood is unique, limited access to quality education, living wage jobs, transportation, decent affordable housing and other resources is common in many distressed communities, which are now also among the most severely affected by COVID-19. Many such communities have long suffered from disinvestment, economic exclusion, and systemic racism. My remarks will highlight five main points about the challenges and opportunities today in Chicago's distressed and hardest hit neighborhoods. First, the pandemic and recession have challenged us all at an unprecedented scale, but residents and businesses in predominantly minority neighborhoods have borne an unfair and outsized burden. Since the first recorded case of COVID-19 in Chicago eight months ago, cases and deaths in minority neighborhoods have been especially high. So have job losses and business closures. Second, while many hoped the pandemic and economic fallout would quickly pass, we find ourselves still struggling to contain the virus and mitigate the economic damage. Until we make sufficient progress in controlling the spread of the virus, an inclusive economic recovery will be difficult. Third, many expirations loom large regarding enhanced unemployment insurance benefits, payroll protection program lending, and restrictions on some layoffs for firms receiving special industrial relief aid. These reductions will test the true resiliency of the U.S. economy. The potential hole in aggregate demand may be large, and in my view, more fiscal relief is needed in order to limit further damage to households and businesses, especially those in vulnerable communities. Fourth, the longer that the dual challenges of the pandemic and recession continue, the greater is the risk of deepening the already stark inequities in our economy. At the Chicago Fed, we recently launched an initiative that we call Project Hometown to examine how our communities can recover from the pandemic and overcome racism and other inequities. In Project Hometown's public forums, many business and community leaders have insightfully emphasized that the long-term disinvestment that Lawndale shares with other West Side and South Side neighborhoods worsens job opportunities during the pandemic, further limits access to food, education, and shelter, and magnifies the many barriers to economic opportunity. Finally, I will conclude my remarks by highlighting the importance of collaboration among diverse actors, including policymakers, regulators, financial institutions, residents, and mission-driven organizations, as well as business leaders, to support Lawndale and other disinvested neighborhoods and to bring about a more inclusive and equitable recovery. Long before the pandemic, neighborhoods like Lawndale suffered from chronic disinvestment, which left them vulnerable in economic downturns. But the pandemic has had a greater adverse impact for several reasons. For one, there have been large numbers of job losses among workers in the retail, leisure, and hospitality sectors since March. Public health concerns about in-person contact and stay-at-home orders have hit these sectors particularly hard. A serious concern is that workers in retail, leisure, and hospitality often are relatively low paid and have little savings, leaving them especially vulnerable to hardship when they lose their jobs. These sectors also employ more women and minorities who have both lost jobs and been hit hard in other ways, such as by having to shoulder a disproportionate share of the extra child care responsibilities or contracting the virus at a higher rate. Notably, many job losses resulted from closures of small businesses located in the city's more affluent areas. But Chicago's longstanding racial and income segregation means that workers losing these jobs tend to live in lower income and minority communities. During the pandemic, minority and women-owned businesses in these communities are more likely to have closed both because of the industries in which they operate and because they have fewer resources to draw on in difficult times. Moreover, many of these businesses likely lack the resources to pivot quickly to online sales. During one of our Project Hometown events over the summer, Nedra Sims Fears, Executive Director of the Greater Chatham Initiative, noted that in Chicago, we're seeing a digital divide among businesses particularly in the inability of some businesses to pivot to online ordering and delivery. 
Moreover, she observed, it has been a patchwork effort to get families access to broadband and other technological resources to give them the hardware, the software, and the training they need so that they can successfully work from home. Business owners' relationships with accountants, lawyers, and financial institutions were important factors in whether their financial records were in order ahead of applying for PPP loans. Early assessments of the Paycheck Protection Program suggest that women and minority-owned businesses were less likely to have received these U.S. Small Business Administration loans, which may have been the result of their limited access to technical and legal guidance. Although these businesses account for smaller numbers of lost jobs, their ability to recover and prosper will be a key test for whether our economic recovery is inclusive. Workers living in predominantly minority neighborhoods are more likely to be in high social contact jobs at essential businesses, which amplify the public health risks. Moreover, these workers tend to earn below average wages and are unlikely to receive hazard pay for the health risks they bear. And for children in low income and minority neighborhoods, the abrupt and continued closures of schools have exacerbated inequities in, ex in accessing education. It is also more important, sorry, it is also more difficult for schools to meet the non-academic needs of students, including providing food, dental care, mental health services, and safety in the current environment. The longer the pandemic and recession go on, the more difficult it will be to achieve an equitable and inclusive recovery. As temporary layoffs turn into long-term unemployment, families will be stressed to make ends meet. The fiscal policy support implemented early in the crisis helped mitigate the worst of the immediate fallout for many families. Unfortunately, many of those fiscal supports have now run out. Unless they are extended soon, financial stresses may greatly intensify. Many low-income households have limited savings to tap into and face the risk of running out of resources. Some indicators already suggest a large drop in spending among low-income consumers after the July 31st expiration of expanded unemployment insurance. I don't think I'm alone in my opinion that we are taking a very serious and unnecessary risk if we do not extend federal assistance to out-of-work households. Also, workers experiencing long-term unemployment risk losing skills and perhaps dropping out of the labor force or even going on disability insurance. Many may need retraining to be productive in the future, not only to refresh skills, but to meet the demand in emerging or reconfigured industries, such as telehealth or renewable energy. During another Project Hometown Conversation, the City College's Chancellor, Juan Salgado, said, Skills that were in demand before are going to continue to be in demand as we move forward. Communications, teamwork, flexibility, familiarity with technology. These sorts of higher level meta skills are the kinds of things that really need to be built into what we're doing because the worker that is going to see success in a recovery is going to be the worker that is really able to provide that added value to the workplace. The longer children are out of school, the harder it may be for educators to connect with them and for students to catch up or feel engaged with their teachers. And nonprofits and mission-driven organizations working in disinvested neighborhoods will find it more challenging to secure the resources they need to serve their communities. Greater fiscal support for such institutions would likely have major long-term payoffs. Coordinated efforts are necessary for an inclusive, equitable recovery. Including our most vulnerable communities in economic recovery and prosperity will likely require much effort and coordination among many different actors. That's why I'm so glad to be speaking with you as we celebrate an example of this coordination today with today's addition to the North Lawndale Employment Network's Community Hub. Nonprofits and state and local governments are at the forefront of providing services to many severely impacted households. They provide food, healthcare, virus testing, help with accessing unemployment insurance, housing, and other assistance. The ballooning need for these services comes at a time when tax revenues are falling and leaving a large and important gap. Community Development Financial Institutions, CDFIs, can help fill in this gap by providing credit and financial services to smaller nonprofits and even small businesses. 
One lesson from the Great Recession is that during bad economic times, scaling up the activities of CDFIs with greater support from the CDFI fund is vitally important for helping our most distressed communities. Along these lines, in a Project Hometown discussion, we heard from Alex Bartik, a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He said that improving social contacts through nonprofits, churches, and social institutions can help improve labor market outcomes in distressed neighborhoods. His observations echo what may his observations echo what my staff have heard, namely that the coalitions of public, private, and nonprofit organizations that came together during the Great Recession have also been providing critical early responses to the pandemic in many communities. In Chicago, we are fortunate to have a significant network of CDFIs, business development groups, foundations, and nonprofits that support lending and investment in the communities hardest hit by the pandemic. One CDFI, IFF, the former Illinois Facilities Fund, which now has a 15 state footprint, was instrumental in acquiring and renovating the facility where the new bank branch will be located. But not all places have the same robust network of CDFIs and other organizations like Chicago has. So we've also been actively engaged in efforts across the Midwest to start and grow CDFI type organizations. These organizations can come together to support their local communities and help bring about an equitable and inclusive recovery. So let me conclude. We have much work ahead in our economic recovery if we are to confront the inequities exacerbated by the pandemic. The Fed's actions touch communities, families, and businesses across the country. We are committed to using our full range of tools until we are confident that the economy has weathered recent events and is on track to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Through Project Hometown, the Chicago Fed will continue to bring together leaders and experts with diverse perspectives to examine how our communities can recover from the pandemic, overcome longstanding inequities, and grow stronger. And we welcome you to join us in these efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. We really appreciate your partnership. Uh, the a lot of people in the business community think of the Federal Reserve as only setting interest rates and monetary policy, but we've heard today how engaged you are in so many aspects of the economy and a real partnership and communication with the business community that is absolutely vital to our uh, joint success. So thank you very, very much, uh, Charles, and thank you for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and move into the main part of our program here. Uh, and I will tell you that, uh, again, I wish we were all together in a room, but uh, hey, we're going to make this work well uh, because we've had a great opportunity to bring together unique leaders in unique times. There's no doubt about it. So uh, Susanna Mesa is going to go ahead and introduce Tim and Tom, but let me tell you a little bit about Susanna. She is head of community outreach for Wind Trust. is a tremendous leader. She not only yes pursues uh, success for Wind Trust, but also support for the communities that Wind Trust serves to make sure there is as much success uh, there as possible. Wind Trust knows that if the communities they serve are successful and growing, they do better. And Susanna is at the tip of the spear of that efforts uh, for Wind Trust. And and Tim, I'll say we're going to claim a little bit of her as our own uh, because Susanna is also a great dynamic member of the board of directors of the Illinois Chamber of Commerce and the chair of the Illinois Chamber's Illinois Business Council, an incredibly important and growing part of our program and importance to the entire region and in the entire state of Illinois. So with that, Susanna, I will let you take it away. Thank you. And thank you, team. And thank you, President Evans. Uh, we share the journey, a journey we take very seriously to um, create an equitable economic opportunity for this area we call home. So again, we're excited to be here. You were set to have an authentic conversation with two leaders that are leading local 
And it's all within the theme of um, economic development in distressed communities. And you heard um, Todd mention the word societal, and it really reminds us that this is the work of being a being socially responsible, right? And doing the work of corporate social responsibility and in a genuine way. And what that means is harnessing the positive power of business to bring about change in our communities and our world. And you're gonna hear from Tim um, a little bit about reinvention. And for those business owners um, with us, I wanna leave something with you that any business owner of any size can do this. Um, taking a page out of our playbook, it's really about identifying your values, aligning yourself with those values, and then executing on those values. And then you execute it in your talent, your people, your operations, your communities, your prospects, all the way to your clients. So it's a really systematic approach and a deliberate approach. So as Todd mentioned, I do serve as chair of the International Business Council. So wearing two hats, I would urge you that as you do your exercise here and find out what organizations you want to align your business with, that you become a member of the Illinois Chamber so that you could have that virtual round table of advisors, if you will. Um, we have been very, very happy and honored to port over some of our best practices to chamber members. And in the spirit of what we're going through, right, there's many that need advice on how to do that profit and purpose, right? How do you execute with a purpose, but generate revenue? And no doubt that's the sign of a healthy business. So something for you to think about as you hear this conversation. So the way this will work is we will do a quick bio. I'll do a quick bio on Tim. He's gonna go through his opening remarks and then a quick bio on Tom, opening remarks, and then we're gonna move into our dynamic conversation. So with that, take it away, Tim. Yeah, great, Susanna, thank you. Um, and let me start with a bright spot that should make many of us smile. The uh, Cubs, White Sox, and the Bears are all in first place. Tom, congratulations. <laughs> uh, the baseball teams are playoff bound, and with apologies to the Cardinal fans, all is right in the Chicago sports world. Um, I thought I might offer just a minute on the business world. Um, the short version is it's good, but fragile. Our lens into the economic health of our state largely comes from our clients, who in my opinion have uh, exhibited a great deal of creativity and persistence in what's obviously been a challenging environment. I'm encouraged by the innovation that's occurring as companies reinvent their business models, in some cases almost overnight. While few would claim perfection, what's happened with on online retail and in higher education and many other industries is truly extraordinary. Clearly, business sectors with face-to-face -face elements, such as hospitality and travel and restaurants, uh, continue to struggle. And our hope is that there's additional government assistance for, at a minimum, those most impacted industries. It appears that we will be in a low or near zero interest rate environment for some time. While not necessarily good for the financial services industry, this should provide some cushion for businesses to get through the pandemic, hopefully without much additional damage. The economy and the need to work from home has created longer term permanent changes that as leaders we should not ignore. As an example, in our business, uh, bank lobbies were closed for nearly four, four months. We serve clients through drive-through methods and through enhanced digital services. Honestly, most people weren't much worse for wear for the experience, and now banks are looking closely at the number of locations they need to serve clients. I know that many of you also have experienced changes that will permanently alter your businesses. Those of you who know interest know that serving our communities is core to our values. Just as the impacts of the pandemic have not been uniform to businesses, the impacts have not been uniform on our communities. We're working very hard to support the hardest hit of these communities. For example, we've been a fixture in the Pullman neighborhood, which has been greatly impacted by civil unrest. Our focus is really on economic empowerment and economic mobility as a path to equal opportunity for individuals and small businesses. Uh, President Evans mentioned North Lawndale. Shortly after the new year, Wintrust will be opening a new location in North Lawndale. In partnership with the North Lawndale Employment Network, we will be hiring staff from the local community to operate this and other Wintrust locations. Providing a physical presence, hiring local staff, and positioning the bank to proactively help individuals and businesses in this community will help provide some of the stability we all seek. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. And Todd, Brent, thank you for the invite. I'm very mindful of the challenges we all face. However, I'm encouraged by much of what we're seeing in the environment today. And I'm very thankful for the positive role that the Illinois Chamber plays in advocating for Illinois businesses. 
Thank you, Tim. Thank you for those remarks. And for perspective from the audience, uh, Tim serves as our president and our treasurer. And also he is overseeing our 15 charter banks. And also to share with you, he's part of our executive management committee and is the chairman both of our Lake Forest Bank and Trust Board and our Wintrust Bank Board. And in terms of civic service, he's also an active member of the a wonderful organization on the board of Metropolitan Family Services, one of the oldest and largest social service agencies. He's also serving on the Bank Administration Institute and serves as a trustee for DePaul University, great institution, which I'm biased to, towards. And in addition, he's been a newly elected board member for Chicago United. So wonderful service, Tim. And for perspective on Tom, before we go into his opening remarks, um, huge fan of Tom Ricketts, we know him well. So Tom, he co-founded In Capital, a distributor, underwriter, and educator of securities and risk management investment. So in 1999, and served as its CEO until 2009. Um, as CEO, Mr. Ricketts created In Capital's flagship Internotes platform that led the firm's diversification initiatives with more innovative financial products. In 2009, he became executive chairman of the Chicago Cubs after leading the Ricketts family acquisition of the team. So Tom, we await your opening remarks. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, my opening remarks, I'll, I'll kind of dovetail on some of the things that have been said earlier. Uh, you know, um, it's, it's been a pretty rough year, and we're very happy that the, the team has, has played well this far. Um, you know, obviously we're in first place in our division at this point, hoping we'll win a couple more games and and uh, get that division clinched and then uh, get on to the playoffs. And and I think that we have, uh, you know, the right the right talent, the right, you know, the right veterans, uh, the right manager to have a deep playoff run. <laughs> but, you know, that, that, that success on the field has, um, you know, is really in contrast to the, the, the challenges off the field. Um, obviously, with with the pandemic, uh, it's been very, very difficult for sports teams to generate the revenues that they're they're normally used to. In fact, with the Chicago Cubs, about 70 percent of the revenue of the team comes from day of game uh, operations. That's selling tickets, selling concessions, selling parking, um, you know, merchandise, whatever. And so 70% um, of our revenue never materialized this year. And the uh, on top of that, the other 30% of our revenue that, that comes from media related sources, mainly television, um, much of that didn't materialize because we didn't play the games. Uh, so you know, we're looking at uh, maybe getting 15% of the revenue that we anticipated this year. And that's across the league, uh, you know, baseball, was uniquely uh, challenged by the by the timing of the virus, given that it all kind of kind of uh, hit us in March, right before the season began. So there was no chance to even start the season like the NBA or the NHL got to do. So um, the league league wide, it's uh, it's it's cost baseball owners about three and a half billion dollars, and so um, it's been a uh, a really serious financial challenge. Um, you know, for, for all teams and, and we're not, uh, and of course we're one of them. Um, it's also been a challenge for our local businesses. Uh, obviously when you, when you open uh, hotels and restaurants and everything that goes on around the ballpark without the ability to bring fans into the neighborhood, those are unable to generate any revenue. So it's, um, it's been overall a very challenging year. I think that I'm proud of our early response when, um, when it all happened in March. You know, the Cubs Charities Group team, uh, led by Alicia Gonzalez, was very quick to to uh, respond to some of the issues in the city. We uh, assisted Lakeview Pantry in becoming the largest food pantry in the area, and we gave large donations to um, various funds, including the Small Business uh, Recovery Fund that the city began. So we've um, we've uh, you know basically done what we can. We did what we did a lot in the early days, and we continue to do all of our stuff through Cubs Charities to support all the neighborhoods throughout our city. So I'm looking forward to joining the panel and talking about the issues that we face. Wonderful, and thank you for sharing that, Tom. It takes a lot, right? So because we're on so many screens, speaking, listening, I wanted to start with uh, humanizing <laughs> our panelists here and perhaps sharing a little bit about um, what's kept you grounded during these times. It could be something fun, whether you're grilling, not grilling, binge watching, not binge watching, what you're reading. Um, so anything that 
maybe resonates with our audience. So with that, um, Tim, you want to go first? What has kept you grounded? <laughs> sure, Susanna. Our, we, we unexpectedly have two young adult children at home, and so uh, that's keeping us grounded. I would assess our current condition at DEF CON 3 oh. right now. So. <laughs> Definitely. I'm sure the audience can relate. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Tim or Tom, how about you? Something that has kept you grounded and then perhaps something fun about your three favorite things to eat at Wrigley. Uh, uh, well, I, 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 I will echo Tim's comments. I mean, one of the things about the, the pandemic that is a bit of a silver lining is the ability to spend more time with family, particularly uh, teenagers or young adults who typically by this time don't want anything to do with their parents. So, um, so we've, we've spent a lot of family time and I'm really blessed that I've had that opportunity. The, um, now it makes me sad that I can't go to Wrigley. As you guys know, at Wrigley Field, um, every game I walk around, I talk to people, uh, you know, I give out little, give baseballs to little kids and I really miss that game day experience. So it is a big hole in, um, you know, in my summer. But uh, my three favorite foods, that's a good question. Um, well, obviously, uh, the hot dogs, and I think that kind of breaks into two categories. Like the, I like the grilled ones with the grilled onions. That's always been my go-to for about yep. 30 plus years. And then the bison dogs are, are, are pretty solid. I recommend that to everybody. And then, um, you know, in certain days, like uh, when I'm feeling like treating myself, I'll go track down a buffalo chicken sandwich. But, you know, we also have, um, you know, the uh, hot dogs out in the bleachers. When hot dogs, the uh, the the hot dog store that was so popular on the northwest side that was closing, I got a hold of Doug and I said, Doug, I know you don't want to work, uh, you know, maybe you don't want to work 360 days a year anymore, but how about just like maybe 81 plus playoffs? And so uh, so Doug put a stand in our bleachers, which he's serving the same great stuff he's always had at, at his shop. So the food is great at Wrigley. Uh, you can't go wrong, but those are some of my favorites. Very good. An idea for another topic, another time about food and what weaves us, right? <laughs> what connects all of us? So thank you for sharing that. So um, shifting over, now let's get started with some questions for both um, Tom and Tim, and we'll start with Tim first. Uh, obviously, we've all said it, it's been quite a year. Um, when you think about the perspective, tech's played a huge role, right? Um, how has technology helped us, would you say, through this? Oh gosh, for I know for us there have really been three things. Um, one, you know, in the April time frame, relevant for many businesses has been the PPP process, mm -hmm. and for financial institutions to deliver those loans, um, it, it was quite an event. Normally, we would go to our tech group and ask for something like that, and they would tell us it would take six months and a lot of money. The question this time was turned around and said, how are you going to do this in four days? And Wintrust has been very successful and we think very helpful to our clients. Um, this, the second is almost everybody working from home. And so um, the technology to make that happen, not only at the bank, but you know, in terms of the broadband, broadband capacity with Comcast and other like providers has, has been challenging. And uh, you know, it took us a week or two, but I think we're in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned this a little bit early in, in my comments. The other piece is, is people aren't showing up at our bank facilities as much as they used to. And so the tools that we offer clients to handle their banking services and reach into some of these communities where maybe we don't have physical footprint have become very, very important. And so we're, we're seeing quite a bit more usage in terms of electronic services. So the, the tech piece has been pretty big for us. Oh, yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. And what about, you alluded to that, the remote environment, right? Can you mm -hmm. share more about what it's like to be um, managing talent now in a remote environment? Sure. Um, you know, I, th I think the key for us was to really dial up the communication. So as we're trying to stay in touch with people and we're trying to share information about what's happening, um, communication's been really important. Yeah. And as you know, as managers, you think you're doing a lot of it and, and there's always an opportunity to do more. And so that's that's been a piece of it. You know, one of the fun things we did is we, we approved or appointed a new CEO and that was our chief entertainment officer. So when you're not at the water cooler, or you're not in the bank having these conversations, how do you have fun? And so we've spent a lot of time trying to make things fun and keep things light, mm -hmm. you know, a tough period. And then maybe seriously is, you know, how you evaluate talent when everybody's at home right. is, is sort of hard. And, um, you know, we're coming up to the time of year where you do that. But I can tell you in our organization, and I've seen it in some of our community organizations, there have been some real champs and people that, 
you might not have expected to perform in ways have done things that you could never imagine. And so we're, we're really pleased. We're going to keep communicating, but we're really pleased. Yeah, wonderful. And obviously this is not scripted. I'm curious on um, for Tom, how are you guys managing your remote workforce and does tech come involved? Anything like that that you can share with us? Yeah, it's been tough. Um, we closed the office down March 9th or something along, maybe March 11th, and we don't intend on going back in any sooner at the soonest, the end of January. So, um, you know, obviously technology is a big part, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, whatever, those kind of those kind of applications. But um, but it's been hard because it's, uh, I mean, it, what we worry about, just like, like Tim was talking about, maintaining culture. Like we don't we don't think that working from home makes us a better organization. You know, we feel like it's we're going to have to overcome the uh, the challenges of losing losing some of that uh, that that culture that that we had. And then when you combine that with the, the extreme financial challenges that we have, it's and it's tough. And when you talk about now the business culture, right? And your organization has done a tremendous job of investing locally there, and obviously you've done a tremendous investment in uh, Wrigleyville. And obviously it helps the state of Illinois in tax uh, revenue and tourism spending. So what are they sharing with you? What are these small businesses telling you? How are they holding up? Um, anything that you also hear from fellow club owners? Yeah, well, and you make a great point. Like the, um, you know, it, it obviously not having fans in the ballpark hurts hurts the team and, 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 the, and the Cubs organization. But but it really is a, is a, a difficult economic issue for the city and the state. Um, Wrigley is the third largest tourist destination in Illinois, uh, behind the museum campus and Navy Pier. Um, there are days where over half of our uh, our uh, fans are from out of state. You know the um, you know they they drive a lot of economic activity uh, throughout the Chicago area, and you know and, and you know we and we give that back like we paid amusement taxes on tickets. You know almost about thirty million dollars a year between the city and the county. Um, we have uh, sales taxes which is tens of millions of dollars to the state. And then hotel taxes, we, millions directly through our own hotel, but tens of millions of dollars from all the hotels that, that bring in uh, fans from, from out of state to come watch Cubs games. So it has a big, um, a big ripple effect on, on the entire economy. And so um, for us, like not just at the ballpark, but our other small businesses, um, you know, we have uh, maybe half a dozen restaurants at our hotel. And all those are, you know, just in survival mode, like you've seen with so many other small businesses that just don't have the um, don't have like the ability to to operate normally. So um, it's a real challenge, a challenge for us. But uh, but it also will provide a, a serious incremental fiscal challenge for our city and state. Definitely. And you alluded to this before on Microsoft Teams. Do you want to care to venture to say what does the future of your workforce look like? I, I think that we're gonna. I, I, our, our people want to come back um, to the extent that that's safe or uh, practical. You know, I think as soon as that's possible, we'll be doing that. Um, like I said, I, I don't think anyone feels like they're better from home. Uh, I think it's just something that we're just uh, just dealing with. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, despite all our financial challenges, you know, we, we've always we've had a really good culture and people like being together and. And um, it's fun to be together, and, and I think you get more done when you're together. So um, I think long run, we'll, we'll be coming back. Now, um, in my financial services world, in my other company, um, most people are back at the office, but there are people that are realizing they can be as effective from home. And you know, a distributed workforce might be the norm in some other industries who now realize that maybe it's it's not great use of resources to keep a large office downtown or a great use of resources to have have associates drive back and forth an hour to their house every day. And you know, maybe they're more effective by just going straight to work in their own in their own environments. So um, I do think it'll have a big impact across other industries. I just think for the Cubs, I think people are going to come back to the office um, when it's when it's practical. Yeah, definitely. New perspectives for all. And I think we've all learned that, you know, relationships matter, right? Um, now, shifting over to the client side, I want to hear from Tim during this pandemic. What have clients shared with you? Well, obviously, we've been getting a lot of feedback, and the stories, you know, range from the, the very, very positive to you know the, the heartbreaking, devastating stories you're getting yeah. from you know people that are heroically trying to save their businesses in an environment where they don't control a lot of the the equation. 
Um, you know, it, there have been some pleasant surprises, though. Um, you know, I mentioned this a little bit in the beginning. The, the way that some businesses have adapted almost overnight to change their business models and to cope with, you know, a situation that nobody would have imagined is, is really, really impressive. And I think it's, it speaks to the importance of, of change and flexibility in, in running a business. And, and we've been incredibly impressed by the way a lot of our clients have handled this, both in terms of market and, and, and financially as well, in terms of how they meet their obligations and, and manage their way through this. Um, I, I agree with Tom. I don't think we're better with people away from the office, but I've been pleasantly surprised on how effective you know, people have been re really working all hours of the day. So, right. you know, the workday is not eight or 10 hours anymore. It's 18 hours. And I've been, I've been pleasantly surprised by, by how well things are holding together. Very nice. And also in the spirit of that change in flexibility. So for Tom, um, you know, you guys have stepped up on the issue of economic opportunity, um, even for Sox fans. So why do you feel it was important for um, a baseball club to put itself out there on what has been such a difficult issue for so long? Well, I mean, when we bought the team 10 years ago, one of the, uh, you know, our first goal was to win the World Series. Our second goal was to improve and preserve Wrigley Field. But our third goal was to be a better neighbor and be more impactful in our city. And, um, and I don't want us to be thought of as the Northside Cubs or the Wrigleyville Cubs or the Chicago Cubs. So we started a bunch of initiatives to make sure that that our charitable, our community impact, our volunteerism touches different parts of the city and, and the entire city. Um, you know, one of the things that we've we've been very proud of is we've spent about forty million dollars doing ball fields and other uh, baseball fields, other types of fields in every part of the city to try to get kids back. Because ultimately, the core mission of Cubs Charities is to leverage the, um, the the power of sport to impact lives. And so uh, ball fields, we um, last year, our programs uh, reached about 26,000 kids throughout the city of Chicago with baseball and softball programs and helping helping them not just get their, their leagues going, but also helping train their coaches in methods of you know, trauma-informed coaching and social emotional learning so that they become more effective coaches for the kids. So when, when we talk about what we give back as a core piece of the Chicago Cubs, a lot of it is driven through the um, through our efforts. We also support, uh, um, you know, eight, seven or eight college kids every year. We also give uh, half a million dollars to local schools. So we're always focused on, you know, the youth side of the equation. Um, now, when the pandemic hit, obviously, we, we shifted and gave a, a large donation to the business recovery fund. And I've also been out talking to different aldermen in the, in, on the south and west sides to look for ways that we can be more impactful. And we're looking for ways to do something larger that will uh, more concentrate our efforts in a, in a single community. Um, so that's that's been very powerful. Um, on the uh, on the in capital side, uh, one of the things that I'm uh, really proud that we're part of is um, we work with foundations that raise money for the community of CDFI as a community development financial institutions. Um, you know, uh, President Evans mentioned IFF, there's uh, CCL, that's Chicago Community Loan Funds, another one in Chicago. But these are these are like the the the, the front line where you know the they're talking to the businesses that need the need the resources. Um, there's organizations, one's called the Calvert Impact, Calvert Impact Partners, one is Capital Impact Partners. And in Capital, what we've done for them is we help them raise money through uh, through issuing notes to the public. So we've done almost a billion dollars of those notes, and those do those dollars get repurposed into community activities, not just in Chicago but all over the country and sometimes overseas. But but anyway, um, for anyone who wants to to make a to make an impact with their investing, I would look at I would have them look at impact investing, and if they're looking at impact investing, I would refer them to. Uh, you know, Calvert's a great example. Capital Impact's another one, but there's there's several where you can you basically make an investment in that organization. They loan those dollars to organizations throughout the country who um, are getting down to the uh, you know to the front line, and then um, and they pay you back. So it's something that, um, like I said, it's been almost a billion dollars of funding for these organizations. I'm very proud of it, and I'm proud of the fact that a lot of the dollars have gone into Chicago's 
uh, Chicago's own CDFIs. And thank you for mentioning impact investing because that does answer the other question. Um, we want to be helpful, right, to businesses and chamber members. And they're asking, you know, how do I raise my hand? What do I do, right? They're asking, if I want to help on the issue of economic opportunity, where do I start? So you offering up impact investing, and obviously we can provide some answers too. Um, so please contact us if you want more information on that. So thank you, Tom, for offering that perspective. Yeah, there's a lot of other programs. You know, one thing that I would suggest is, um, uh, you know, if, if there's a neighborhood in mind that, you know, that if you have a particular uh, neighborhood that you want to help, um, you know, reach out to someone in that neighborhood and see which organizations are most active or most effective. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is something that, that, um, that, that we've thought about in terms of, you know, the, uh, there's some big organizations and you don't quite know what exactly happens once the money goes in, but, but like, you know, finding who is, you know, which of the organizations have uh, a good local presence and an effective local presence is something I would recommend if, if you have a specific neighborhood you want to help. Oh, yeah, we can obviously provide can perspective too, on absolutely. that. <laughs> now, um, Tim, thinking about a second round now, second round of government assistance, um, your comments, is it needed? Well, yeah, I, th I think for many businesses it is. Um, certainly the, the challenged ones we talked about, the hospitality business, the entertainment business, the face-to-face mm -hmm. the -face businesses. Um, and, and if you think about restaurants right now, they've, they've been able to get by you know, with some outdoor type activity and they've been pretty creative with tents and things. I, I think as the weather starts to turn, you know, that, that just gets tougher. Oh, and, yeah. and the structural issues for those businesses to succeed you know, really get challenging. Um, so we we would very much support you know a second wave for you know if if not the small business community and as a large um, those impacted businesses. I mean our our interests and our success and our ability to help are very much aligned with what happens in the city and in the state of Illinois. And so um, again we're we're cautiously optimistic, but I I think things are fragile. Oh yeah, and what would you say maybe as your concerns, right? On that note, your concerns for these businesses and other businesses going forward in the event that there's a second wave of the virus? Well, I, I, you know, our, our concern, and you know, selfishly, the, the world is not very friendly. The equity markets are not very friendly to banks right now, and they, they clearly expect that there will be some credit deterioration or that there'll continue to be economic weakness. So, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to see us get through um, the fall into the election with some momentum, because if there if there is a health related second wave, you know mm -hmm. people are fatigued a little bit, and yeah. um, you know I, I just think that you know the capacity to continue to prop up some of these businesses is is going to get a little bit more difficult the longer this runs. Oh yeah, yeah, so. it's, it's a challenge, and a little bit of shifting gears on future focus um, uh, for Tom. You founded and served as the CEO of a successful, obviously, financial services firm that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think the chamber could become more involved in promoting the idea that, you know, kids from distressed communities could see themselves in a career in finance? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, first and foremost, and some of the programming that we focus on at the Cubs is it's not so much directing a kid toward a career in finance, but just making sure that they really focus on their education in general. Um, I mean, the studies show that, that your, your, your life economic opportunities will largely be defined by how far you went in school and making sure we keep as many kids in school for as long as possible and give them their chances. Um, you know, there is, there's, there's a lot of programs out there for kids that are in school, but once you drop out of school, like it's, it's really hard. And of course you're, um, you're, you're on a path to, uh, you know, you know, have a very difficult life. So um, so we focus on just education as a whole in general, just to keep kids in school and, and get them through the challenges they have. And um, hopefully if they can get through high school, there's a lot of programs to help kids uh, get into college and particularly disadvantaged kids from, you know, from neighborhoods that have challenges. There's, 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 always, there's, there's gonna be college chances for these kids. And you just hope that they can overcome all their, um, all the, societal pressure on them or societal issues they have to, to stay on that track. And if they do, they're likely to have pretty good life chances. And that's that's really the key, giving them better life chances. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it takes all of us. And it sounds like, you know, we're up for the challenge as well as 
uh, no doubt probably other Illinois Chamber members and those looking to join, obviously to raise their hand and uh, make a difference, right? We, Tom mentioned it too, have, harnessing that uh, positive power of business to have a change in our communities. So for both of you, as we wrap this up, and we've talked a lot about um, different themes, different topics, but all with this economic development for distressed communities. Um, your organizations are obviously, but oh, we are, but known to be community focused and yours too, Tom. How are you staying connected in an environment that is prohibited of face-to-face -face contact? Maybe Tom, would you like to take this first? Yeah, it's hard. Like, uh, you know, face to face contact is kind of our primary method of uh, getting together with with all of our all of our fans. And so, um, yeah, we we've done uh, we're doing one tomorrow, a season ticket holder uh, Zoom call. You know, we've tried to reach out social media. You know, we've, we've stepped up our efforts on that front just to try to stay in front of our fans as much as we can. You know, fortunately, uh, we have our network up and running which has been a great, great success. And um, and we can create a lot of content that that fulfills the fans needs. But ultimately um, for us, like, and I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know when I can't see it early next year, but when we need to everyone get back, we need everyone back in the ballpark. I mean, ultimately for baseball, how you feel about your team is, um, it's so much driven by how you feel about the ballpark and the game day experience. And uh, we've worked so hard to make Wrigley the best game day experience in sports, and um, it's just so so disappointing that we can't we can't use it. But um, you know we'll stay in touch with our fans as many ways as we can, and um, and then just you know keep our fingers crossed that by sometime next year we can be operating normally again. Yeah, very good. Thank you. And Tim. Well, it, it, yeah, a couple fold. I mean, we're we're still open in most of the communities. So there's a 180 wind trust locations in, you know, mostly the Chicago land area and southeast Wisconsin. And and while we can't do the volunteer work that we normally do and like to do, um, at least not to the the level we're used to doing, we we continue to provide support to small businesses and individuals. And and we'll continue to do that until we can kind of get back on the you know the path where we can do everything for folks. So Very we'll keep good. at it. Thank you. So Tom, thank you for sharing your perspective. I think you shared a lot of good tips that um, businesses can start to implement right away. Um, please contact the chamber. We'll be happy to provide some of those nuggets and additional resources. And obviously we're a resource here at Absolutely. Wintrust too. So thank you, Tim, for your time. My pleasure. And the wonderful conversation. I'm gonna turn it over to Brent. And again, thank you to all of our attendees and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, well, Charles, Tim, Tom, Susanna, thanks for a great program today. And thank you also for the work each, each of you and your organizations are doing to support and strengthen our communities here in Illinois. It's greatly appreciated. Um, I again want to thank our sponsors today. And I also want to give a shout out to Matt Gams uh, with Wind Trust and former board chair for helping arrange our program today. On behalf of the board and Todd Meisch and the chamber team, we want to thank you for joining us today. And we'll hope, hope you join us next year for this program. Everybody have a great afternoon.